Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Alberta Transplant Seminar. And we're uh, um, and we'd like to uh, recognize uh, uh, the helpful support from Paladin in hosting this um, in helping us host this seminar series. Before we get on with today's um, excellent seminar, we'd like to make everyone aware, uh, if you're not already, that the ATI is currently undertaking a strategic planning process. And we're currently seeking feedback from everyone who's interested in donation and transplantation in Alberta to contribute their thoughts on what the ATI's priorities uh, should be for our activities. Your, uh, your input is really very welcomed. You'll see the link posted in the chat and we encourage you to both fill out the survey yourself and please share it with any others who you think may be interested. So today's, uh, it's on with today's seminar. Um, today's speaker is Dr. Nick Murphy. Nick is a postdoctoral fellow and a bioethicist with the Departments of Medicine and Philosophy at Western University. His work with the research group of Charles Weyer explores issues in research ethics, particularly as they relate to organ donation and transplantation. He's a trainee with the Canadian Donation and Transplantation Research Program and is participating in several of the CDTRP's major projects, including uh, in the International Donation and Transplantation Legislative and Policy Forum, which um, had its meeting uh, about three weeks ago, where he's a member of the Research and Innovation Chapter. And those, uh, the work of those chapters will is now in, um, in uh, uh, publication preparation, um, so watch for more from that. So Nick is gonna be um, talking about controlled organ donation after circulatory determination of death, uh, especially scoping the ethical terrain. Um, as many of you may know, controlled DCD has proven an important strategy for increasing the pool of eligible organ donors. And yet, despite growing acceptance and implementation of controlled DCD in many jurisdictions, ethical controversy surrounding aspects of the practice remain in the medical and bioethical literature. Given these unsettled ethical debates, it's critical that stakeholders are sufficiently aware of and engaged with the breadth of ethical views and considerations relating to the practice. Dr. Murphy's talk will familiarize attendees with this ethical ter terrain, uh, discuss key themes, concerns, concepts, and arguments, and provide an overview of prominent debates. So Nick, welcome. Thanks, Lori. Uh, thanks for that introduction, and thanks to the Alberta Transplant Institute for inviting me. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I'm just going to share my screen. Great. Okay, first, uh, before I get started, let me acknowledge the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewak, and Chinonktong nations from whose traditional lands I'm giving this presentation. Today, I want to give a little crash course on ethical issues and ethical debates in controlled organ donation after circulatory determination of death. As a bioethicist interested in ethical issues relating to organ donation and transplantation, I hope you'll find this presentation a useful primer on ethical issues in this particular form of deceased donation. And I hope as well that you'll find it a little refreshing. You can relax your brains for a bit because I promise there'll be no technical language, no equations and no graphs. Uh, I have no conflicts to disclose. This talk is based on a recently published scoping review I co-authored with my colleagues at Western University in London, Ontario, and it'll be structured as follows. First, uh, to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm gonna spend a bit of time explaining what exactly controlled organ donation after circulatory determination of death is, how it contrasts with donation after neurological determination of death, and the particular logistical challenges it raises. Then I'll give a really quick sketch of the purpose of the scoping review and how we went about it. And after that, I'll discuss the review's main findings, or at least uh, some of the most interesting ones. And I'll conclude with some thoughts on the implications of our findings for the resolution of at least some of the ethical debates we identified. Okay, what is controlled organ donation after circulatory determination of death? The first thing you need to know about this form of organ donation is that like everything in medicine, it comes with all sorts of confusing acronyms. So the, for the most part, I'm gonna to try to avoid acronyms, but I hope you'll allow me one. I'm gonna to refer to controlled donation after circulatory determination of death as just DCD. As you probably know, there are two kinds of deceased organ donation. First, there's donation after neurological determination of death, also known as donation after brain death. 
Donation after brain death happens when donors are determined to have died because they've lost all brain function, usually after a brain injury or stroke. Second, there's DCD. DCD happens after life-sustaining measures are withdrawn from a patient in the intensive care unit, and the donor is determined to have died based on the cessation of their circulation. That is, the blood has stopped circulating spontaneously around their bodies. That's why it's called donation after circulatory determination of death. The organ donation community is tasked with striking a very delicate balance. On the one hand, it needs to try to increase the supply of good quality organs for transplant. But on the other hand, potential donors must not be treated as mere sources of transplantable organs. They need to be treated with the dig dignity and respect they deserve. Partly for this reason, the organ donation community has long subscribed to the dead donor rule. And according to this rule, organs can only be recovered from, in, from individuals only after they've been declared dead. Or to put the point another way, no potential donor should die as a result of the organ recovery process. Now, although the processes of donation after brain death and DCD are different, both forms of donation are united by the dead donor rule. The rule reflects the legal prohibition against killing, protects donors from harm and maintains respect for them, and helps to maintain trust in deceased donation. DCD is performed with patients dependent on life-sustaining treatments within an intensive care unit who don't meet criteria for brain death, but who are expected to die within a short period of time after treatment withdrawal. So candidates for DCD are patients with a poor prognosis, who don't meet the criteria for brain death, and for whom the family or other surrogates have made a decision to withdraw life-sustaining measures and consented to organ donation. After surrogates have made these decisions, life-supporting measures are withdrawn and the potential donor begins to die. As soon as their circulation stops, healthcare teams wait a period of time to ensure that it doesn't start up again on its own. In Canada, this wait period is five minutes. The donor is then declared dead and the transplant team recovers the donor's organs for transplantation into waiting recipients. Now I wanna draw your attention to something that's important about DCD. And I'm gonna do that by contrasting it with donation after brain death. In donation after brain death, organ supporting technologies sustain the patient's breathing and circulation up until the point of organ recovery. Because organs continue to receive blood and oxygen, the organs recovered for transplant are often in fairly good condition when recovered. Organ donation after circulatory death is different because after life-sustaining measures are withdrawn, organs are no longer receiving all the blood and oxygen they need to remain optimally viable, and they're damaged as a result. This damage often means that donated organs don't work as well as they could in recipients, and sometimes the damage is so severe they can't be used at all. This is why in DCD it's important to move quickly. The sooner the organs are recovered, the less damage they sustain. But this introduces a tension between two important objectives. On the one hand, you can't break the dead donor rule, so you need to be sure that the donor has really died. On the other hand, you want to start organ recovery surgery as soon as possible. This tension introduces some ethical challenges that I'll talk about in a bit. The last three decades have seen a rapid adoption of DCD, both in Canada and around the world and its increasingly widespread use has offered a welcome expansion of the donor pool. In Canada, up to 30% of all deceased donors now donate via the DCD pathway. And although 2020 saw a drop due to COVID-19, this number is trending up over time. Despite growing acceptance of DCD, our recently published scoping review shows it's not uncontroversial. In what follows, I'll be highlighting some of the key ethical controversies surrounding DCD. Before I do so, a really quick word about our methodology. And I hope you'll forgive me, but I'm gonna hum over the methodology for the scoping review because I wanna spend as much time as we can talking about ethical issues in DCD. We followed Arxia and O'Malley's methodological approach to identify all important ethical issues, concepts, and debates on DCD in both the medical and bioethical literatures. In the end, we reviewed 167 publications that contained substantive discussion of ethical issues and organized our findings into six iteratively developed themes. 
Our review identified a number of recurring themes and debates around DCD. The first three concern the dead donor rule, the definition of death and criteria for its determination, and the concept of irreversibility. These themes are best addressed simultaneously, I think, because first, they're a little abstract, so I wanna move through them kind of quickly. And second, they're kind of intertwined in, in a way that makes it difficult to understand any one of them without having some understanding of the others. As I mentioned, the organ donation community subscribes to the dead donor rule, according to which organs may be recovered from donors only after they've been declared dead. So to act in accordance with this rule, there obviously needs to be clear criteria from when in, for when a donor is appropriately considered dead. But to figure out what the appropriate criteria for death determination are, you need first to have some idea of what death is. This is because the criteria for death determination are just the indicators of when a person is dead. The criteria themselves are not the definition of death. Now, it might surprise you to learn that there's no agreed definition of death. In the past, this wasn't such a problem because at a certain point, it, it's fairly straightforward to be able to point at a body and say that that body is a dead body. It's cold, rigor mortis has set in and so on. But in the context of DCD, you want to recover organs as quickly as possible following the donor's death. So you need to be able to define the precise point in time at which death has occurred. And this isn't all that easy. There are accepted criteria for death determination in DCD. But even if we think that these criteria are the right ones, they still rely on the notion of irreversibility. According to circulatory death criteria, a donor is appropriately considered dead only when their blood has irreversibly stopped circulating around their body. But what does the term irreversible actually mean? In the context of DCD, should this term be understood to mean would not be reversed under any circumstances or will not be reversed under these circumstances or does it mean circulation will not resume on its own? The answer here has important implications for the question of whether DCD violates the dead donor rule, which in turn depends upon a coherent definition of death. This might seem like a pretty abstract issue, um, but it's actually kind of important for the purposes of DCD. Think of it like this. Most people think that you can't come back from the dead. We think of death as irreversible. If Frank is dead, there's no bringing Frank back to life under any circumstances. But if irreversible should be understood to mean can't under any circumstances be reversed, then at least some DCD donors are not dead. This is because in at least some cases, spontaneous circulation could be restored with medical interventions. So this raises the question, has the dead donor rule in fact been, been abandoned? Is DCD in violation of the dead donor rule? And if it is, does this mean that DCD is ethically wrong? The answer to these questions turns on how we understand the term irreversible. Now, the way this debate was resolved in the donate, donation community is a great example of how thoughtful ethical argument can help to make progress in medicine. Instead of wading into deep philosophical waters on questions of what death is really as a phenomenon, the debate was refocused to more tractable ethical questions about what ought to be done in the concept, context of DCD. In response to critics who say DCD violates the dead donor rule, proponents of DCD reinterpret the term irreversible to mean permanent. While irreversible means that something cannot under any, any circumstances be reversed. Permanent means that something won't be reversed. This re reinterpretation relies on a normative argument, meaning an argument about what should or ought to be done. That is what the right thing to do is in a given context. On this view, what matters is what should be done in this context, the context of DCD, and not what could be done in a different context. Think of it like this. If Fred has a heart attack in the park and his circulation stops, a passerby might be able to revive him with CPR. This would be the right thing to do because presumably Fred isn't ready to die and it would be in his interest to carry on living. In DCD, by contrast, 
a moral decision has been made not to resuscitate Fred because it would not be in his interest. Fred has no hope of meaningful recovery and it would be in his interest to no longer live. A decision has been made to allow Fred to die and so resuscitating him would be wrong. Moreover, waiting long enough that Fred's condition is truly irreversible would also be morally wrong because waiting that long would mean his organs could not be used for transplant and this would violate his wishes. The point is that even, if, even though in some cases spontaneous circulation could theoretically be restored, this is just not morally relevant to DCD. This theoretical possibility does not change the fact that Fred's breathing and circulation has stopped and will never resume, and that's what death is. As Sam Shammy put it, the issue is not whether the body or brain's circulation and function can be resumed, because it can, but rather whether it will be. Admittedly, this is a pretty abstract issue, um, but I felt I had to say something about it because debates over irreversibility, the dead donor rule, and the definition of death used to really dominate the literature, um, and, and this debate is still ongoing. Now, I wanna discuss another less abstract debate that frequently comes up in the literature, one which concerns how we should think about the balance of benefits and potential harms for the DCD donor. At the heart of this issue is the question of the extent to which the donor's care at the end of their life can or should be altered in the interest of successful donation. As you may know, depending on the protocol, there are some unusual things that can happen in DCD. And they're unusual in the sense that these things wouldn't happen if the patient were not a consenting candidate for DCD. For example, to make DCD possible, life-sustaining measures might be prolonged to allow for donor workup or to allow time to identify suitable transplant recipients or for an organ recovery team to assemble. In some places, withdrawal of therapy occurs in or near the operating room as opposed to the intensive care unit. And this is so that organ recovery teams can recover organs more quickly so as to minimize damage to them. There, might, there might also be certain interventions performed while the donor is still alive, and these are called anti-mortem interventions. For instance, in some protocols, healthcare teams administer certain drugs, such as heparin, an anticoagulant used to improve the chances of successful donation. And this will help to improve outcomes in transplant recipients. Clearly, these changes to end-of-life care are not designed to medically benefit the donor. Instead, these changes to end-of-life care are designed to benefit the organ recipients who later receive the, the deceased donor's organs. And this is unusual because we normally think about medical interventions as being therapeutic. When you administer an intervention to a patient in clinical context, you do it to benefit them medically in some way. But these changes to end-of-life care are not administered with therapeutic warrant. That is, they are non-therapeutic interventions undertaken on one person, the donor, designed to benefit another, the recipient. This has stimulated some controversy in the medical and bioethical literature. Why? Consider this provocative comment from Michael Potts. Procedures that can only cause harm to a patient without providing any benefit are unethical, and the person performing them is no longer practicing medicine. Of course, most critics aren't this vocal, uh, but the non-therapeutic interventions performed on DCD patient candidates have given some commentators pause. The worry is that these changes to end-of-life care harm donors without benefiting them at all. Consider, for example, that anti-mortem interventions like heparin pose a theoretical risk of hastening death, and prolongation of life-sustaining measures won't change the pa patient's prognosis. Does this mean that the patient is being instrumentalized or treated like an object? Are physical risks like this acceptable? It's not unreasonable to wonder how these practices are justifiable when they pose a risk of harm, yet offer no medical benefit to the donor. Especially going back 10 or 20 years, there were serious debates on these issues in the medical and bioethical literature. But more recently, a growing number of commentators have made convincing arguments to the effect that this worry is rooted in an unduly narrow interpretation of the concept of best interests. They argue that the concept of best interests should extend beyond medical interests to encompass the interests of patients in what becomes of their bodies after their death. If you take this perspective, physicians aren't harming donors, 
They're respecting the donor's autonomy by helping them to fulfill their interest in posthumous donation. Donors have concrete interests in the success of a transplant. Benefits to donors, their families, and recipients shouldn't be ignored in this equation balancing benefits and harms for the DCD donor. For this reason, changes to end-of-life care and anti-mortem interventions are justifiable even if they don't provide any medical benefit to the patient. Now, even if we accept this argument, there remains the issue of how to determine appropriate risk thresholds. For those interventions that pose some theoretical risk of harm to donors, what level of risk is appropriate? Unfortunately, there is as yet not enough evidence on the risks of anti-mortem interventions to answer this question. Greater clarity on the risks associated with these interventions will inform debates on their ethical permissibility. All these changes to end-of-life care give rise to another prominent concern in the literature that I want to touch on just quickly. Most people, even registered organ donors, are surprised to learn about the various ways in which ordinary end-of-life care can change in DCD. Some are even unsettled when they learn about it. The obvious question then is whether consenting donors have in fact truly consented to DCD and everything it involves. While it might be argued that consent to organ donation could be viewed as consent to take all reasonable steps to maximize organ viability and ensure that transplantation is successful, there's growing consensus that in addition to generic consent for DCD, specific consent to anti-mortem interventions should be obtained from surrogates. That said, the tension in the, de the debates I just touch on raise important, raises important ethical questions that continue to stimulate some controversy in the literature. While some argue that potentially harmful interventions shouldn't be allowed, others argue that prohibiting them would be wrong because it would prevent the fulfillment of the donor's wish to donate organs in the best possible condition. Since these are value-laden arguments, ethical debate is likely to continue. The need to strike a delicate balance between increasing the supply of good quality organs for transplantation and treating potential donors with the respect and dignity they deserve is at the root of the problem of conflicts of interest in the context of DCD. Conflicts of interest are a pressing issue in DCD in part because as Dar and colleagues note, the ambit of interest extends beyond the donor to the donor's family, the recipient, transplant professionals, institutions, and society generally. And they involve issues such as priority setting, resource allocation, and so on. We found arguments to the effect that conflicts of interest could conceivably arise at pretty much every step of the DCD process, from determinations of futility and decisions to withdraw life-sustaining measures, through practices to ensure surrogate, con uh, to ob obtain surrogate consent, through decisions on donor management, and even with respect to institutional policies around DCD. The basic idea here is that, is that there's a risk that healthcare teams will be perceived to be guided or will in fact be guided, whether unconsciously or consciously, primarily by their desire to secure viable organs for transplant, when in fact their primary focus should of course be on the care of the patient. Despite the many conflicts of interest that could arise in DCD, the vast majority of authors argue that even the perception of these can be mitigated or eliminated. Indeed, this is one area where there seems to be uncharacteristically strong consensus. Conflict of interest mitigation strategies were noted in all the reviewed consensus statements on DCD we looked at. The most commonly proposed is the separation of care and organ recovery teams. Since unseparated teams may be influenced by conflicts of interest, those that care for dying patients and those that secure consent or recover organs for transplantation must be strictly separated. Separation of teams will address both real and perceived conflicts of interest in DCD. And guidelines also address these conflicts of interest by emphasizing that decisions about withdrawal of life-sustaining measures must, be, must precede and be separate from any discussion of organ donation. I should note though that a few critics take issue with the view that these mitigation strategies will effectively eliminate all conflicts of interest. While possibly possible in theory, they argue, these strategies are unrealistic. As I just mentioned, even though conflicts of interest may not actually arise in DCD, even perceived conflicts of interest are problematic 
because they could have a negative impact on public and stakeholder trust in deceased donation. Public and stakeholder trust in the context of deceased donation is critical for the success of donation and transplantation systems. For this reason, it is important to recognize all the ways in which this trust might be put at risk. Our scoping review, review revealed lots of worries relating to public trust in the context of DCD. For example, some argue that the practice of DCD might inflame public anxieties about medicine because it tests the boundaries of acceptable practices in healthcare. Others argue that perceived conflicts of interest will lead to mistrust in deceased donation. And still others that anti-mortem interventions or controversies over the dead donor rule will be unacceptable to the public. Indeed, arguably all the controversies surrounding DCD you can find in our scoping review could undermine public trust in deceased donation. Here's how most of the arguments relating to public trust look. Substitute anything you like for X. Put it into this argument. The concern we have raised regarding X is worrisome. Disclosure of the uncertainty and debate around X will therefore erode public trust. Because of these concerns, there's consensus in the literature that full transparency and consultation with the public are essential for determining the ethical appropriateness of the various elements of DCD protocol. However, the consensus on the need for transparency and public feedback you can find in the academic literature seems not to have translated into robust public education and engagement. This is a bit surprising. And it leads some to worry that not enough is being done to inform the public about DCD. There are so many other fascinating issues around DCD that I don't have time to talk about. These include questions around the uncertain temporal relationship between the cessation of circulation and cessation of brain function in DCD donors, worries about the impacts on family members of DCD donors, and emerging challenges relating to novel surgical technologies like normal thermic regional perfusion, a technology which recirculates blood in the donor after their death and potentially invalid invalidates the justification for death determination. I do hope we'll have time to talk about these issues after the talk. But for now, let me just finish with a quick reflection on the implications of the scoping review's findings for the resolution of some of the ethical debates we identified. I think the most interesting finding of the scoping review uh, is that the apparent dichotomy between ethical and empirical questions in DCD is a false one. And that science and ethics need to work together to help resolve some of the outstanding ethical debates. Indeed, it looks like there are at least a few outstanding controversies that research can help us answer. To give just two examples, yes, it's worrisome that some anti mortem anti-mortem interventions could theoretically harm donors or hasten their death. But okay, let's do some trials to find out what these risks are, and then we can talk about whether they're permissible. And yes, it's worrisome that DCD might impact public trust in deceased donation. But again, let's do some qualitative research and find out if that's really the case. An example of how empirical research can inform ethical debates in DCD can be found in the recently published DPART study. When we started in on this scoping review, there was lots of controversy over whether the five minute wait period after cessation of circulation before death determination was enough to make sure that the donor's circulation would not resume on its own, and hence, whether DCD donors were really dead. DPART was a large multi-center international observational study, which found that among 631 enrolled patients who had life-sustaining measures withdrawn in the intensive care unit, not a single one showed spontaneous return of circulation after five minutes. And this helped to allay some concerns over the appropriate hands-off period. However, I hope it's clear from this crash course on ethical issues in DCD that some debates can't be resolved by empirical research alone. Prominent issues I've covered today point to ongoing disagreement around fundamentally ethical questions. How should we construe harm? What does it mean? When, can, when and how can care be alter, altered in the interest of donation? What are the limits? And what kind of consent processes are needed for DCD? Given different perspectives on these ethical questions, it's possible that the variation in DCD protocols that we see around the world isn't just to be expected, but also embraced. 
If this important and promising form of organ donation is to continue to develop and expand, protocols might have to be adapted to local moral, social, and cultural perspectives. Further dialogue, public feedback, and analysis are required as DCD advances and becomes even more widely used as a means to expand the donor pool. I'd like to thank my colleagues and collaborators on this project, including my supervisors, Charles Vare and Marat Slesarev, as well as my mentors and colleagues, Maxwell Smith, Jennifer Chandler, Erica Chamberlain, and Tennille Gofton. And a big thank you to the New Frontiers Research Fund for funding this project. Thanks very much. And I'll be happy to uh, chat about these issues more in the, in the question period. Terrific. That's um, really a, a, an amazing um, set of work and takes us, as you said, into a different kind of realm than um, some of the empirical science discussions that we've had here. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, let's start off with a, a question. I'm going to ask Murray, Murray Wilson, who has put a question in the um, in the chat, but why don't you go ahead, Marie, and, and uh, share some of these thoughts and questions with us? Sure. Um, so first of all, a great uh, presentation of a, a highly relevant area to all of us, particularly me, and best of season to everybody that is uh, online. Um, I have a particular uh, functional question. How do I advise my lawyer to go to some kind of template for my personal directive that allows me to communicate to my family and to an ICU doc who might be, may not be, but might be a very conservative one with regards to informing my family about what all this process is about and what death is about and my objective of preserving my organs and, and tissue um, past being uh, technically dead, uh, you know, through the perfusion. I, I mean, how, how, how does my lawyer get uh, some kind of guidance to put in my personal directive, my wishes? Thanks for the question. Um, I have to, I may have to uh, pass on the question because I'm afraid I'm, I'm not uh, uh, trained in law. Um, just looking at your question here. Um, uh, I'm afraid I can't answer that question. I mean, you can do an advanced directive, but if, if um, am I right in reading that you you are considering made? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you yes. Uh, well, you 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 cannot do an advanced directive for made. You need to be. Uh, in well, it's a it's a tricky. Um, uh, edge to walk between having a physician that recognizes you're inclined so or not and that's maybe a separate and and red herring issue mm -hmm. but if i want to make sure that my family and the icu doc who might be over you know we've got some very progressive icu docs and we've got some very conservative icu docs in this overlap area how do I make sure that they know what I wish and uh, follow my wishes? Uh, I, I would, I would, I would have to advise you to speak to a lawyer on that issue. You could do an advanced directive, and most lawyers don't have a clue about. Yeah. That. Okay. Yeah. And so you're very eloquent in this area, and I would guess that there are a few others on the line that are quite eloquent and overlap with. Uh, the legal area. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. It's a question on the table. Uh, and I don't need an answer today, but I'd like an answer maybe tomorrow or in a yeah. few months. Absolutely. And, and uh, I'd like to open it up as well to the floor if anyone wants to comment on that. I know in Ontario, for instance, if you're considering MADE, you can reach out to TGLN, the, the local organ, do organ donation organization, uh, to express your wishes and formally agree to um, make plans. So it may be a similar, similar case in uh, in Alberta. I wonder if I can't uh, be more help there. Yeah, maybe what I could do, not to put Dennis on the spot, but I'm going to put Dennis on the spot. Dennis Djokovic, um, do you have some comments that you'd like as a, you know, as an intensivist actively involved in donation, Dennis? I was afraid you might, might uh, 
pick on me there, Laurie. But, uh, but thanks for including me. Murray, great, uh, great questions. And Nicholas, uh, excellent presentation. Um, I think I'm going to take a step back and just to make a comment that I observed and one that uh, sort of delves into that in the BCD side. And you know, Nicholas, you'd brought up the, um, the issues with specifically BCD and interventions. Uh, you know, do they, do they benefit the donor? Do they benefit the recipient? And can we do anything to the donor? Uh, it is a very difficult question because um, as you mentioned, you know, there is no health benefit to the donor. But I guess one of the things in my mind is that, you know, if this is an element of allowing this individual the you know, benefit of altruism and helping out their fellow man and woman and, and through organ donation, is that the benefit, right? So when we looked into this, um, without going into details with regards to our own made DCD process, I thought the ethics would be much more difficult, but in fact, it seemed like they were a little bit more straightforward because we could actually discuss all these things with the individual themselves and not have uh, consent from family or uh, you know whoever that designated person was where we're trying to anticipate what would this individual say if they were here in front of us and could be a part of this conversation and with the approach to you know may DCD we actually have the individual in front of you know, the, the people that are involved in making those decisions that can say, yes, I consent to these. Yes, I realize, uh, you know, administration of this medication or this test doesn't benefit me directly, but may benefit others, which is my intention. So I, I thought that ethic part, uh, ethics, uh, not discrepancy, but the, the separation of those two, it was interesting in my own mind to see. So, um, you know, in my reflection on Murray's question is, is, is that legal part? And I don't know how to answer that either, other than I, not being a lawyer, but I can't say that any true advanced directives have ever really helped me at the bedside as an intensivist because they don't go into the granular details that I need to know. Uh, and that's where I just ask the family my own questions about what would happen or how would this individual feel about the following things happening? Can we go through those? So uh, you know, the, the legal side is a bit of a mystery to me, so I don't know if we can ever get that great answer, but I do think that bringing these questions up with your healthcare providers um, are as good as going through the legal process. I mean, that's where that consent process comes from. We don't get lawyers involved for, uh, you know, blood transfusions. We do the physician consent model or for operations itself. So I think this would also go in the realm of that, but uh, I may not answer any questions, but Nicholas, I, I thank you for your uh, your presentation. It's very well thought out, and certainly brings out some interesting observations and thoughts. Thank, thank you, you for your comment. Um, I'll just say too, you know, in the the legal again, I'm not a lawyer, but the 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 legal environment here is a little more permissive than in some jurisdictions. So, you know, something like. Uh, I think the Canada Donate study found that 95% of DCD donors uh, receive heparin, a bolus of heparin, anti-mortem. Uh, but uh, heparin is not permitted in uh, other jurisdictions because it's of no med medical benefit. So the UK is an example where it's not used. Um, I think that the fact that we have a slightly more permissive regime here means there, there's great opportunities to explore these anti-mortem interventions in, in clinical trials, randomized controlled trials, which unfortunately are very logistically difficult to get underway. But I think, um, you know, as we move towards deceased donor intervention research, that'll be the next step to assessing the safety and eff efficacy of anti-mortem interventions. And at least we can do that here given informed consent. Um, but again, I think I think the point you bring up, uh, Dr. Jog Jogovic, is um, interesting in that with uh, MADE, you're able to discuss the wishes of the patient with the patient themselves. Whereas if you have, um, uh, severely critically ill patient in the ICU who has consented to donor uh, to donation, let's say, but hasn't anticipated anti-mortem interventions or what would be involved. Then you need to discuss with the, then you likely need to discuss with the family whether they would have ac accepted these things. And I, I'll let Murray make a comment as well. And I'd just like to say another thing that I didn't get a chance to touch on is um, the impacts of, on families of DCD is uh, such a fascinating area of research and um, looking to ways that ways that families can be supported is really important. One thing that really stands out is that families often aren't aware of how long 
it will take for donor workup before withdrawal, and that can be very distressing for them. So there is some question in the literature, you know, if the donor didn't know that when they consented or, you know, signed their donor card, would they have wanted to put their family through that? So the, there, are, there are lots of interesting issues that I think that qualitative research could help us answer in this area. Well, I, I agree that the qualitative research is going to take some period of time to reach an operational consensus. Um, I may not live that long. So in the interim, and I may not die in the jurisdiction within, you know, it could be BC, it could be Alberta, it could be Ontario, it could be the UK, it could be Spain. And so I'm just in a practical conundrum that I know I'm putting you guys on the spot about in areas that you're not experts at, and I'll leave it at that. And maybe you can pass it on to some of the uh, legal uh, oriented ethicists and uh, see what they say. Okay, I'm sorry to take up so much time. Not at all, and I will do so. Thank you. So it, it's interesting, though, that uh, it's, you know, we, we kind of, I think in our, at least I do, in my mind, you kind of rely on the legal, the final say being what's legal and what isn't. But we found out through some of the work of Tim Caulfield and his colleagues uh, a few years ago when they looked across all the jurisdictions in Canada as to what the law was. Um, about uh, families being able to, uh, about consent, you know, how rigorous the consent was of someone who consented to organ donation before they died through some registry process, and then the legal, uh, the legal ability of their family to override that. And, and they found that in every province in Canada, uh, uh, someone who was of sound mind could consent to, to, to donate, to, for their organs to be donated after they died, and that there, there, that was legal, that was the law, and that, that really there was no, um, nothing in the law that even allowed their families to have a say in it. And yet, we know also that in every province across the country, in practical terms, the family is always asked, and donation will not proceed if they are against it. So we've got this clear distinction between practice and um, and healthcare delivery from the legal aspects of it. What do you think, uh, um, Nicholas, and maybe Dennis, about that conundrum? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think um, um, critical care physicians and healthcare teams are trying to strike a really delicate balance. You know, they, they you know, it's, 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 a, it's easy for um, legislation to say that patient autonomy trumps everything. Um, but in the context of, you know, you know, a family that's distraught already after serious illness or injury of a loved one, um, it would be very difficult, I think, for any uh, healthcare professional to say, no, we're overriding your wishes uh, of the family members, and we're going to proceed with donation. Uh, I just, I just, I think that the, the moral compass within healthcare professionals uh, won't, won't allow it. Um, maybe Dennis wants to Chime in. Yeah, I guess my, my feelings with consent are that, uh, you know, if you have a surgeon standing in front of you who says, I'm going to take out your appendix and here's what I'm going to do, here are the risks, here are the potential complications. Uh, they assess the patient and they think that they understand what's going on. But I mean, if the patient is completely intoxicated, uh, if the patient doesn't receive that information, can they actually give consent? And I would say they can't. I think my, my own challenges with the online system is that it's actually not a consent process. It's, it's, it's an implied interest, right? I mean, if you go online and put in your consent for organ donation, um, you know, you were at home. Can we even prove it was the individual? Um, can we prove that they weren't completely intoxicated at the time? Uh, consent implies that they've heard about the risks, drawbacks, and benefits. And I don't think that happens in an online process. And I think that's where Nicholas's you know, comment really comes into play with regards to, can we override you know, a consent process? But from my understanding, it's not actually a legal consent. A surgeon can't call the patient at home and say, do you want your appendix out? Check mark. They have to tell them the risks. They have to tell them the benefits. They have to confirm that that patient is the one they're talking to, not their neighbor and they have to confirm the patient actually understands what's going on. Um, so it's, it's challenging from that perspective. And I think that's where the online registries 
uh, are very valuable in applying the understanding and intent. I think it's an implied intent, but I don't know if I can actually go on blind to saying that it's legal consent. Well, you know, that raises some interesting points. Um, I mean, the legal work done by the law professors <laughs> says that, 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 that those are legal consents. And maybe, maybe they're not all like, you know, online versus not online versus in person and so on. But um, certainly in, the, in uh, some jurisdictions, such as in the New, New England area, um, it's been looked at also from the legal point of view, and it and this, the conversation starts differently. Then it's it's the conversation with the family is not, I'm here to ask your permission, but rather your loved one indicated that their wishes were to, and I'm here to facilitate that process, which I think is is a is a different kind of process, isn't it? Um, but the other thing that comes up that's really interesting, Dennis, that you just brought up is that is that is this issue of consent and if the person has already died because if they're dead already they they can't they can't, they can't give you know consent isn't required from a dead person if if my understanding of the legal the legalese is so so it's not quite the same thing as when we think about informed consent to a surgical procedure like an appendectomy because when you when you're deceased consent cannot it's a whole different thing isn't it yeah and you know the what uh, what you know thinking about this all in the context of dcd though is you're talking as well about anti-mortem interventions and changes to usual end-of-life practices in which you would imagine uh, informed consent would be required not just authorization and which might you know be the legalese they use for uh, donation after neurological death I think uh, what you're what you're touching on, though, is something that I didn't really have a chance to talk about in the talk is just the inadequacy of the consent processes, generic consent processes, um, you know, online or um, uh, signing a back of your driver's license in some places. And and I want to talk about that just slightly uh, uh, with reference to a question that popped up here in the um, in the the chat box, Nick mentioned that full transparency on risks and benefits is helpful for building trust, but that this idea perhaps hasn't been reflected in public education programs. Any idea why that is? The answer to that uh, is very controversial and it ties into why aren't there more uh, in, uh, detailed consent processes online? And you have people in the literature who speculate that it's because we don't want to tell them. We don't want to tell them what's involved in all this because then they won't do it. So um, it's same with consent process, same with public transparency. No, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that that's the real intention. But there, there are, uh, there are a lot of concerns out there that, you know, lack of awareness and lack of public engagement is this sort of utilitarian informed masking strategy to where you're hiding from the public what's really going on. You're hiding these really important controversies and ethical questions, which should be decided democratically and through public feedback. Um, so that, that, that is something that uh, is quite controversial that you'll find in the literature. Um, it is a bit puzzling why more, there isn't more um, public education and feedback. And it's, it's, not, it's not totally wild to wonder whether it's um, partly to do with this fear that it'll affect uh, donation consent rates. I wonder though too, you've also got people like Murray and, and others, um, myself included, I could one day be in a position where my organs could be used and I would be adamant that, you know, that in, in some ways we still have a bit of a paternalistic attitude toward what the public, including us, including people who have actively vigorously said, I want to be an organ donor. I want you to do everything you can uh, if I'm in that position to ensure, and I would be welcome anti-mortem anti inter interventions, and I would, well, so I think we sort of always assume that it's going to be the other way, and, and, yeah. and we're taking, you know, we're missing the voices of the Murrays uh, of the world who say, no, I, this is really, really important to me, this is what I want to do, by, by assuming that it's going to be uh, a burden when maybe it isn't. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really, I know, I, you know, I'm the same. Um, um, most people I've talked to on this issue are the exact same. I think the problem is developing policy for this, right? Because 
you know, I come into contact with a lot of people that are very pro organ donation and that's, that's natural. You know, that's kind of my sample, right? Uh, because of the work I do, but it, you can't have a blanket policy with, without uh, get, ha letting other people know what's going on and uh, talking to them because not everyone will agree, right? So the arguments about, well, consent to donation entails consent to anything involved in donation and anything that's gonna help achieve a successful donation and transplant. That's just not gonna work for policy because uh, not everybody is gonna think that way. Mm -hmm. um, we have, thank you. We have another uh, comment from Donna. Uh, who also commented a bit earlier here. Uh, Donna put in a comment a little while ago. Many years ago, I ended up sitting at a friend's house and was introduced to a neonatal intensivist. She had just visited a lawyer to make her will. In the end, she ended up drafting wording that a doctor in the ICU would understand what procedures specifically she would want and not desire. And in the end, the, the lawyer didn't charge her as he said he had learned more than he had contributed. Um, I think is is really, is really interesting. And, and Donna has also added that consent becomes honoring last wishes as defined by what, legal or family? Thank you, Donna, for those comments. Can you, can you uh, do you have a comment on that, Nick? Um, well, I think, uh, um, is it something we need to that we're not capturing in our in the areas of research that that could be um, maybe targeted in the kinds of qualitative uh, research that you you mentioned earlier? Yeah, I wonder. Um, yeah, I wonder if this is sort of speaking to sort of the normative implications of consent. It's not just a yes, you can do this. It's an act of choice saying. I want this, right? It's not just a sort of a, a question, yes, no, it's an active choice saying I want this. So given an opportunity to consent to these things, to organ donation and everything it involves is actually sort of a validating personal, personal thing and, and fulfilling those wishes is respecting the prior autonomy of the deceased. Um, um, definitely we could use more qualitative research on, on these questions though. Uh, it's just so hard to get a uh, big enough sample uh, to get generalizable results on these questions because it's just, we're a gigantic country, you know? Well, that's a good point. And, and do you, in the work that you did with the, uh, that you're doing with the um, International Forum, uh, legislate, uh, Legislative and Policy Forum, do you have, uh, there've been a lot of international inputs to that. Do you, do you see some things that could instruct us here in Canada from other jurisdictions? Oh, um, uh, with reference to consent? Well, just the under, maybe understudied areas that, that we could learn not only from launching research studies here, but, but learning from research that's been done elsewhere. Well, yeah, I mean, I think a big question that really needs to be explored is what the public thinks about the role of brain activity for death determination. Um, in DCD, it's an open question really, uh, what's going on in the brain after five minutes. Um, you know, it's very likely that nothing is going on at all, um, but it would be interesting to know more about what the public thinks about the role of brain activity for death determination, uh, whether that's important to them, uh, things like that. And it would also be uh, uh, interesting to explore more perspectives on different donation consent models, uh, what people are, would be willing to accept and what they want. Uh, and, and finally, uh, we've got uh, one last question, um, benefit to a patient in quotes, you know, patient and family perspectives on what that actually means. Um, and it could be highly culturally specific. How can that best be considered in, an, in the ethical or policy debate? It's a really good question. And I think, um, you know, I'm not sure I mentioned it at the outset, but I meant to, but there's wide variation in DCD protocol around the world. You know, it's, it's practiced in dozens of countries, but uh, um, the, the precise practices and differ from country to country. And I sort of speculated in the talk that this might be a reflection of different cultural perspectives and, and values. And I, I think there's nothing else for it to accept that there's not gonna be a universally applicable um, form of DCD that will, will be acceptable in every society. 
in every culture. And that's sort of why I speculate that uh, we should embrace these differences and, and, uh, and you know, encourage different societies to, to um, design DCD protocols in accordance with local cultural, uh, cultural values. Yes, thank you. Um, so we had a couple of additional comments that people can read just before we go. And I, I think it, a, a lot of, uh, of, of um, comments in the chat on, on how can we guide our, the people who prepare our directives, the people who help us with these end of life practical issues to, uh, to actually get the wording right. And I know when, when I did my last look at, at my directives, it was impossible to, uh, to actually put down what both Murray and Anne have put in here um, uh, and Donna, the, you know, capturing the fact that, well, no, I don't want to be sustained on, on uh, uh, um, organ support systems forever, uh, but I also don't want to cut it off before things can be done practically that would uh, allow my own wishes to be determined, but but the wording, the actual practicalities of the wording of those things, um, a template or um, or the, the the kind of things that uh, one could put in there, you know, maybe that's another area of, of of research to guide policy that we could we could look at you, Nick, for bringing. Yeah, forward. I'll get started. <laughs> It'd be a great it would be a great subject for another uh, talk in your seminar series, which is great. Not from me, uh, but from a lawyer. But uh... <laughs> okay, so we're going to have a next time. We'll, we'll we'll plan a panel, and we'll have Tim here, and yeah. we'll have you here, and we'll have Dennis here, and we'll kind of put everybody on the spot and thrash it out. <laughs> um, so thank you very much, uh, Nick, for such a wonderful presentation, and thank you to uh, everyone who's weighed in the chats and your and uh, Murray and Dennis and and your. Um, your thoughts and comments are really helpful. Uh, I'll just uh, close with a couple of, of uh, announcements. This is the last seminar um, before the holidays. Um, and again, we would really, uh, one last request to share your views in the survey. Um, it's really important to us as we do strategic planning moving forward. Um, in keeping with the donation theme in general, we'll be back on January 12th, uh, the, where the ATI seminar will be Sunny Donani and Vanessa Silva y Silva. And they'll be talking about um, the Canadian donation physicians and do donation coordinator networks, uh, burnout, resi resilience, and compassion uh, compassion fatigue. And so uh, please join us then. And um, we can, we thank you again, Nick. We thank uh, Paladin for their support. And um, we wish you all the happiest of holidays. Uh, stay safe and warm, and we'll see you in the new year. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much.